All right. Well, I am ready to get started. So I hope everyone is too, especially Colby, because he's going to be our main attraction today. Thank you all for coming to our TLC event. As you're aware, we do these every Wednesday at noon. Um, they're great. They're fun. My name is Don Sauce here. I'm the Associate Director of the Teaching and Learning Center, and I'm very excited to, to be here with all of you every week. Today, our special guest is Colby Morberg. He'll be presenting on course readings and information source credibility, increasing student familiarity with university extension and government publications. If you saw the promo video, basically what I heard him say is we're gonna talk about readings. We're gonna talk about how we get our students to readings and how we get them to respect readings based on the uh, resources that we can share with them. So I'm really excited to hear his thoughts as well as the thoughts of all the rest of you. To give you a little sneak peek of what's coming up next week, uh, we plan to have Ellie Sayer come and talk to us about equitable practices and undergraduate mentoring. Um, teaching is all the things. It's not just classroom teaching. So we're really excited that Dr. Sayer is gonna come and tell us about undergraduate mentoring next week and we can share our thoughts on that. So without further ado, thank you so much, Dr. Morberg for being today. I'm very excited to hear what you have to tell us. All right, thank you for the welcome. Uh, so I'm gonna sh uh, share a link to the slides uh, just in case you guys want a PDF copy of the slides for later on. There's, there's some links that might be of interest in there. Um, but I'm going to share my screen and we'll, we'll get going here. Oops. All right. I'm going to swap, swap views here just a second. All right. You guys see the full screen now? All right. So yes, yeah, so, so what, what, what all this comes down to is our students go online a lot and they look for information. And uh, one thing that I've thought about quite a bit in the last uh, six years since I've been at K-State is how do we get them to kind of look beyond just the first, uh, the first response or, or first click on a, on a Google search. So, uh, so that's kind of the crux of, of this talk for today. Uh, what I'm going to uh, cover is first I'm going to talk about the course uh, that, that I teach that's related to, to today's talk. And uh, for that course, I had some choices I had to make about the textbook uh, that was used in the course. And I'll talk about uh, what options I had and the decision that I made, uh, which was ultimately to develop uh, soil, soil and water conservation and annotated bibliography. I'll talk about some of the strategies that I uh, use for assigned readings and how I facilitate effective discussion in my course. And I'll give an overview of an ongoing study that we're doing uh, to try to, uh, to measure uh, students' perception of information source credibility. Then I'll have some conclusions, and then we're going to have some open discussion at the end. All right, so the course that I teach, uh, it is Agron 635, Soil and Water Conservation. I teach this every uh, fall semester, and it is an upper-level undergraduate, lower-level graduate course. Uh, it's usually a mix of about two-thirds undergrads, one-third grad students. And what I found when I first started teaching the course back in uh, the fall of 2015 is that uh, the book that had been assigned or required for this course for, uh, for long before I started teaching it, uh, which you see on the right, uh, the students were buying it and they would bring it to class and maybe they'd use it as a reference occasionally. Uh, but uh, when I would assign a chapter for them to read, uh, rarely would they actually read those, uh, those assigned readings. And so I was looking for something that uh, would be hopefully a cheaper option uh, but also something that they would actually uh, be inspired to read. And in addition to that, I also wanted to flip the classroom. So that was sort of the inspiration for the change that I was seeking in this course. Uh, I looked at some different textbook options. Uh, there were uh, two other commercial textbooks that were available, but they didn't quite fit what I was looking for in the course. Um, and so uh, ultimately what I decided to do is go with our fourth option at the bottom, which is a collection of free online resources that I would, I would sort of assemble and, uh, and we'd use that for the, uh, for the required readings for the course. Uh, so, so that was the decision, as go with this free uh, collection of online resources. And, uh, and those were uh, consisted of extension publications, uh, government publications, reports, and fact sheets, as well as publications from NGOs and other uh, free education resources. And eventually that uh, uh, morphed into soil and water conservation and annotated bibliography. Uh, so I, my initial idea was just to have a list of stuff they would they would read, uh, basically a set of what 40, uh, 40 or so different reading assignments. Uh, but I I realized that it could be a lot more than that and actually be a useful resource uh, for the students throughout the whole semester uh, with lots of information, but also a good resource for uh, farmers and ranchers and soil conservationists and so on. 
Uh, so I, we eventually made it into this annotated, annotated bibliography. And what I like about this approach is that it exposes students to uh, credible information sources in their field. And it also made an opportunity for the students to actually contribute to uh, the open textbook for the course. I wanted to keep them engaged in actually developing the course content. And that also led to uh, two research questions of mine. Uh, one is, does this annotated bibliog uh, bibliography change student perceptions of information source credibility? And second, uh, does exposure to extension and government publications train students to seek those types of information sources out? So I was curious about that. So I'll get to uh, how I'm incorporating those research questions into an ongoing study. First, I wanna provide some more context. Uh, so the annotated bibliography that was created was published in 2019 by New Prairie Press. And if those of you that, that are familiar with New Prairie Press, it is an open access uh, publisher that is administered through the Center for the Advancement of Digital Scholarship uh, here at the uh, K-State Libraries. Uh, so uh, the staff there has been uh, been really helpful. I know a, a few are are uh, present today, uh, but uh, but they were really helpful in getting this thing off the ground. And we also uh, developed it in a program called Pressbooks, which is an online uh, book publishing platform. And we were able to export this book. Uh, as in, in several different formats, as a PDF, uh, a Mobi format, EPUB, and a web book, uh, which is kind of hosted through the Pressbooks webpage. And so we had lots of different formats. You can see a, a screen capture uh, of, the, of the website. So it, what I like is it, it's screen adaptive so the students can read this from their cell phones, which I, th I think the students also appreciate. Um, one thing that also is nice is that it, it can be optimized for accessibility and there's ended up being a lot of content in it. So there's 13 chapters and over 700 citations for all the content that went into the book. So ended up being a pretty extensive resource and a bigger project than I had sort of initially envisioned. Uh, but with this textbook, I'm gonna talk about some of the strategies that I use for, uh, for actually getting the students to read the assigned readings and uh, keep them engaged in the content. Uh, so the, the most important one is just communicating to the students uh, what those reading assignments are. Uh, so what I what I do in Canvas is I have a page that gets updated each week uh, or before each lecture uh, with the assigned reading uh, for that upcoming class, and so they can click on a link from there and and get access to that uh, to that particular reading assignment. And so they get several days' notice, uh, if not uh, if not longer, uh, on what they need to read ahead of time. And I also give them notice if it's going to be sort of a longer read. Uh, so most of the readings are like four to eight pages, uh, but they can be as long as 20 some pages. So I give them a heads up if they need to budget some more time for it. I also incorporated some accountability into the course. Uh, so I wanted them to, to know that I actually cared whether or not they read this content. And the best way to do that is to incorporate that into the, the grading system. And so participation in the, in the lectures uh, in the lecture discussions uh, based on reading those assigned readings uh, accounts for 15% of the overall grade. So there is some teeth in this. Uh, and what I would most commonly do is just uh, call on the students uh, if there was a lull in the, in the discussion in class uh, and I call on them by name. So the first trick is to actually know them all by name, uh, but I call them by name and I would ask them sp uh, specific questions uh, from that particular reading that was assigned for that lecture. And the key to this is to, uh, to really kind of play hardball for the first few lectures to make sure that everyone knows that they are being held accountable to actually complete these readings. And then from then on, uh, I, I rarely have any issues with students uh, forgetting to read the assignments or, or kind of budgeting time for it. So, uh, so this, this has worked out pretty well. I know in the, in the AQ system, they have some other examples like the fishbowl activity. Uh, I've tried that and, uh, and really, I think for this class, it's small enough where uh, just having a, a a whole class discussion with the 10 to 20 students that are enrolled each semester. Uh, seems like this format kind of works the best. Another strategy that I use is what I call, uh, or, or what some people call open pedagogy, uh, where the students actually become the teachers. So they either lead discussions or they give presentations uh, based on content that they get to choose. And so uh, in this class, uh, there's a big chunk of the course that focuses on conservation practices and another big chunk that focuses on government agencies and policies uh, related to soil and water conservation. 
And what I do is I give them a list of potential topics and they get to choose what their most interesting topic is. And, uh, and from there, uh, they are in charge of either giving sort of a formal like lecture presentation uh, or they can lead a discussion with the rest of the class uh, based on some assigned readings. Uh, so, uh, so I kind of let them sort of take charge of, of the content delivery. Uh, what I also do with this is if I notice that there's something that is an important point that may have gotten uh, lost or, or forgotten during their presentation, uh, then I'll try to make comments or ask questions to kind of fill in the gaps to make sure that all the, the important information is covered. And also, uh, while the students are kind of doing their thing, I'll be at the whiteboard at the front of the classroom uh, writing notes and kind of outlining all the important information for each of the topics. And, and then what I do is I take a picture of the whiteboard and I, and I post those notes or that picture of the notes uh, on the Canvas page. They all have a nice thorough uh, set of notes that covers all the main points from each of the topics. And all in all, I think this works uh, pretty well for having good discussions in the course. Uh, another way that I uh, wanted to both engage the students but also kind of get them immersed in these reading assignments is to use uh, what some people call, call OER enabled pedagogy. So this is kind of taking open pedagogy one step further and allowing the students to uh, not only become the teachers, but also uh, create the content that is used to teach in the class. And a common way this is done is having students or incorporating students into the development of open textbooks. And one book that I highly recommend uh, that's uh, free for all of you is a guide to making open textbooks with students. So I got a hard copy of this at the Open Education Conference uh, back in 2018, and I read the whole thing and my, my uh, flights back home. And by the time I got back, I was ready to jump into this project and, and incorporate all the students into and developing what eventually became this annotated bibliography. So, uh, so a strategy that I use for this is as the students were choosing topics that they wanted to present in class, I also had them develop a written annotated bibliography on that topic. And so these written assignments uh, with the student's permission through a memorandum of understanding, uh, they were able to uh, contribute those annotated bibliographies to, uh, to a chapter that was in the textbook. Uh, now, uh, the students are able to, to select their own topics. And in the process of this, uh, the students were taught how to search for relevant content, how to evaluate the credibility of that content, and also how to cite resources using the open source uh, program Zotero, which is a citation management program. Uh, so they got some skills along the way. And what was interesting to me was that their biggest concern uh, was actually being identified explicitly with what they wrote. Uh, so they didn't want to have like one section being attributed to them explicitly. Uh, what we ended up doing to alleviate that is uh, all the students were credited as a chapter co-author on the chapters that they contributed to. And uh, we also had a, a several round uh, editing process, where at first I would go through and edit all their submissions. Uh, and then we also had a technical editor go through and just to make sure that there was a consistent voice across all the different sections, even though we had, in the end, we had 20 different students that contributed to the textbook. Uh, so, so that was kind of an interesting uh, outcome from this. Um, and then there's still more content that we wanna to add to the book. So with, with new additions, we'll have more contributions from students each year. Uh, so we're, we'll, we'll continue to add more content to it. Now this leads me to, uh, to the hypothesis uh, that I have for this ongoing research project. And that is that regular exposure to extension and government publications through reading assignments from an open annotated bibli bibliography will increase students' perceived credibility of these types of information sources relative to other types. So in a nutshell, uh, do the students perceive things like extension bulletins or extension publications and government publications as more credible relative to a bunch of other information types? And also, do they actively seek those out? Now, I realize that some of you might not be familiar with, uh, with what we mean by ex extension publications. So K-State is a land-grant university. And so there's three main missions, teaching, research, and extension. And on, on the extension side, the goal is to basically educate the public. So not necessarily the, the college students that are here on campus. Uh, it is educating the, the, the rest of the, the citizens of Kansas. And uh, one of the main ways they do that is through extension publications that you can 
grab from your from your local extension office if you want to, or through uh, one of the websites for the extension service. And this type of system is is present throughout uh, throughout all the land grants around the U.S. Now, what's nice about these is that they are uh, generally pretty concise, so they're usually uh, less than ten pages, and uh, rarely are they longer. But in some cases, they are. Uh, but they're usually pretty concise and they're written for a general audience, so they're easy to read. And they're very prevalent within the, uh, the, soil, uh, the soil and water conservation discipline. Uh, they are written by credible professionals, so uh, faculty that are extension specialists here at K-State or extension agents throughout the rest of the uh, extension service in Kansas uh, or in other states. And generally they go through some sort of, re of review process. So that could be an internal review where it's within a certain academic department uh, or it could be across universities where it resembles more of a traditional kind of peer review process. Uh, the one downside with these is that they are rarely open, openly licensed. And by that, I mean, they, they usually have a traditional copyright uh, where all rights are reserved. Uh, and that makes it difficult to incorporate them or just take the content and immediately kind of slap it into more of a traditional textbook format for, uh, for what most uh, open textbooks are. Uh, so the, so we can't really take that content and put it in there directly. But the advantage of an annotated bibliography is that we can cite it, we can describe what it is, and then link to it, and there's no violation of copyright, but the students can still kind of access that content. And so there's a wealth of resources like this, and I wanted to kind of incorporate that into, into the course, but also make students actually seek this stuff out. Uh, so for this project, uh, we're working with uh, five other universities. And so we have Auburn, Austin Peay State University, Cal State Chico, Dickinson State, and Fort Hayes State, uh, as well as K-State. So we have six institutions. And uh, at each of these institutions, uh, the person that teaches the class most closely related to the course I teach, uh, they have all adopted uh, soil and water conservation and annotated bibliography as the primary text for their courses. And, and so we're collaborating with all these people that have adopted the same book. And what we're gonna do is conduct a survey at the first and last week of each semester to sort of get a before and after look at how the students perceive the credibility of different information sources. And so all in all, we'll have potentially over 200 students that could participate in the survey. Uh, now the, the different types of information sources are all listed on the right side. So we have 15 different types and we're gonna conduct these surveys through Qualtrics. Uh, so it'll be online. It's an anonymous survey. Uh, but we do include information or questions about uh, demographic information. Uh, again, we have 15 different information source types. And for each of these 15 information source types, uh, we ask the same question. Please rate how you perceive the credibility of, and then we list the type of information source. And for each of those, we do a Likert scale uh, question or rating where they rate it as not credible, somewhat credible, credible, very credible, or extremely credible. Uh, so. It'll be interesting to see uh, how those ratings uh, change before and after this, this semester. In particular, we're, we're interested in the kind of middle three here. So we have extension publications from land grant institutions, federal government documents, reports, or websites, and local and state government documents, reports, and websites. So we're kind of interested to see how these three uh, change with their perceived credibility after those students have been exposed to these types of resources throughout the entire semester. Uh, we're also asking uh, th three related questions. And so the students are given this list of information source types and they're asked, which of the following types of information sources do you actively seek out during an initial search for information? And relate, related to that, uh, which do they uh, prefer to cite in papers and other writing assignments? So it, there could be a difference between what they actively seek out initially and then what they eventually uh, cite. And in particular, I'm kind of curious on where Wikipedia articles uh, land in, in, that, uh, in that rating. And then the last one, which of the, which of the following information source types do you actively avoid or ignore? Select all that apply. All right, so, uh, so for each of these three questions, we also follow, follow it up with a prompt where they're asked to give a text response to explain why they selected the things the way they did. So it'll be interesting to see uh, just how, how this all kind of pans out and what the changes are over the course of the semester. Uh, so what's next? I guess instead of conclusions, I have what's next because the study isn't really done yet. Uh, the study is ongoing. We started it this spring semester. 
Uh, we actually just got our IRB approved last week. Uh, so getting kind of a late start to the spring semester, but we're starting it this semester and it'll go through fall of next year. And my hope is to maybe present the results from this in a future uh, TLC discussion here. Uh, if you want more information, uh, these links, you can get them through the PDF that I shared uh, in the chat, uh, but you can get a copy of the, of the textbook or read it online. I also published a case study related to the textbook, and there's also a 10 minute lightning talk that I presented at the Open Education Conference that was virtual uh, last fall. Uh, so I want to acknowledge the funding that we've gotten. Uh, so we got recently got funding from the Association of Public uh, Land Grant Institute land grant universities, APLU, uh, through their Innovative Teaching Award. And we've also received funding from the KSA Open Al and Alternative Textbook Initiative and the Open Textbook Fee. And there's my email and Twitter handle if you have any questions or want to follow up after, after today's session. So with that, I'm going to open it up to questions for me. I see we got some in the, in the chat already. Uh, and then later on, I want to have a discussion among all of you with two questions. One is what strategies do you use to engage students in assigned readings? And also, uh, do you teach students, or how do you teach students to seek credible information sources? All right, so you guys have any questions for me? So, so Colby, I, I loved so much of that. I mean, I love the collaborative experience you're providing with your students, you're empowering them with education, you're embracing the land grant mission, I love all that. One of the things that stuck out to me that you said though is that, your students didn't want to be connected to their writing. Um, I think one of, one of the coolest things that, you know, I, I want my students to develop is some ownership and some pride in what they're doing. So I'm kind of wondering, you know, what you've kind of done to, to help them through that. I understand the imposter phenomenon and, you know, I could never write anything worth publication, those kind of things that an undergrad might feel, but how do we kind of shepherd them toward being proud of their contributions here? That's a good question. Um, yeah, it's something that I, that I thought about quite a bit when we were first figuring out exactly how we're going to attribute uh, the authorship for all, for all this content. Um, I guess one of the things that we ultimately decided on with having them be listed as uh, chapter co-authors is I think having them listed as a chapter co-author actually might show up better on the resume or CVs down the road because then they're a chapter author. So that's a lot better than just being, uh, just writing like one little section and, and only getting credit for, for one, one little blurb. Uh, they contribute to the, the overall bigger chapter. So I think it might be more impactful for them just in terms of bolstering the resume. Uh, but yeah, in terms of getting them more proud of their, their content, um, yeah, that's a good question. It, some of the students had right, really needed almost no editing at all. Uh, some of them, the writing required quite a bit. And, uh, but my, my promise to them was that I was going to go back, go through and, and make it all a consistent voice, uh, just like I, I edited for all the, uh, the other contributors that weren't students. And then we have a technical editor go through and make sure the grammar is correct. And I've, I also kind of use myself as, as an example and to show them like the type or the, the extent of edits that I get from a technical editor before I submit a paper. Uh, I have a, uh, like a uh, editing consultant that I do for some of my writing. And I show them that uh, even professors like me uh, still have a lot of improvement we can do on writing. So it's always something that we, we improve over time. Thank you, I appreciate but, that. Yeah. Colby, I've got a question about how this might apply to um, videos. I work with a lot of media. Mm -hmm. I'm in the journalism school and our students are learning how to do uh, social media, video editing, uh, audio, podcasts, things like that. And there's a ton of uh, YouTube videos and, and other uh, sources like that. Do you see uh, a possibility of using something like that in a resource book like you, what you've created? Yeah. Uh, so, so you're meaning like them creating videos uh, and then having a cited within the annotated bibliography? Is that what you're asking about? Um, either that or, or just citing videos yeah. in the annotated bibliography um, that would be used, that they could use for <clears throat> for learning in a specific media area? Yeah, that's that's good. Good question. Uh, so uh, we did include some videos in, in the bibliography. Uh, I don't know if we had any student submissions, but yeah, I, I would definitely be open to having uh, students do that instead of like, making a video that could be cited instead of just writing 
an annotated, annotated bibliography. I think that's it's a different skill set, and it's something that's beyond. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think I have the skill set to actually teach it, uh, but I think there could be there could definitely be some use there. We can um, collaborate on that. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, and, and one thing that uh, it, with YouTube videos in particular, uh, YouTube already has the licenses kind of built in for each of the videos. And one thing that students learn through this whole process is about the different uh, Creative Commons licenses mm -hmm. and about copyright laws and, and what their rights are as, as creators of content. And yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think it's kind of a good situation to actually kind of incorporate video creation as part of this. And uh, one other question, maybe um, indirectly related, is your book, is it uh, actually printed or is it a digital book? Uh, so it is a digital book. Uh, I've thought about trying to make it so that it can be like a print on demand book, uh, but it's it's available as a PDF. And then I think you can also get a, a, a PDF that's made for print. Uh, the tough part with that is it has a lot of URLs. And so mm -hmm. to really keep the functionality, you kind of want to have a digital PDF where they can link out to those other yeah. resources. That's actually what I was thinking. If you, if, especially if you're linking them to videos or other online content like that, mm -hmm. having it be digital would be much more useful that yeah. way. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. If you were going to go for printed, then using like QR codes or something for the URLs would probably be the be best way to approach. Plus, then you can also update the QR codes where they point to behind the scenes if any video kind of moves places or things. That's a good idea. I hadn't really thought about the QR code approach. Yeah, I'll, that might, might be happening now. <laughs> That's a good idea. Thanks. I was, right. just, um, I was just curious, Colby, on the research project that you have. Um, I know that each field's different, sort of what resources students will use after they're done with their degree, kind of in their profession. Is part of the goal for them to learn which resources they can rely on once they're done with their program and they need these, like when they're working out, I don't know, in conservation areas or something like that? Or was it just simply to see if they understand how to find reliable resources for research papers or for other information? while they're in school? I think it was a bit of both. Uh, so we, we do try to, in, in the Department of Agronomy, we try to engage our undergrads uh, with our extension agents because once they're done at K-State, they don't interact as much with the teaching faculty as they did while they were here. Uh, but um, <laughs> the extension agents that uh, we have sort of explain it in that uh, they're, uh, they as extension agents are the teachers for everyone from when they're born to when they die. And then us as teachers sort of get the, the four years or more uh, while they're here. And so we, we try to build a relationship where uh, they know that they can come ask uh, us teachers questions like while they're in a, in a course. Uh, but once they're finished, we still want them to, to reach out to K-State uh, faculty for questions later on too. And that's, uh, so it kind of comes to the extension part of things. And so I wanted them to, uh, to hopefully kind of build that relationship, uh, but also to see extension as a as a as a easy way to get answers to the questions that they have yeah i was just i was trying to brainstorm how this would work like i'm in business how this would work for business students because they're not going to use extension in the same way but perhaps there are other resources we can be targeting for them to understand this is where you should probably get your information um you know when you have questions outside of even this class like later as a professional yeah yeah that's uh, I guess one thought that kind of came while you were saying that. So uh, one, one of the inspirations for this is in, in soil science and agronomy, there are like almost no open textbooks. The only two that I know of that exist are the two that I've made. <laughs> uh, so there's, there's not nearly the resources that are, are open and free textbooks as there are in other um, uh, disciplines. I know for business, uh, there's actually quite a few open textbooks. Uh, and so... Um, I guess that's one that I consider is there, there are uh, free resources like that. But I do think that even in disciplines where there are open textbooks available, I think these types of annotated bibliographies are a good way to, uh, to get them to look beyond a textbook and, and find re reliable information sources. 
So, so Colby, I have, a, I have a little bit of a different question on this. And this is something that, that people have asked me before. So I figured I'd pass it on to you because you're one of the experts. Um, this stuff takes a long time. This stuff, stuff takes a lot of work. In, in many ways, it's a labor of love. Um, do you get any credit for doing this kind of in, in your department, your merit evaluation, tenure promotion, those kind of things? Because a lot of people are saying that I would want to do something like this, but it takes away from my research writing time or, or some of the other things that are more explicitly credited in merit, tenure promotion, those kinds of things. So I was wondering if you wanted to comment on your experiences or recommendations for how this fits in there. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so, uh, so as far, as far as I know, as of July 1, I will have gotten tenure. So I'm just waiting out for, uh, uh, for that big, big step. Thank you. Um, yeah, so yeah, when I started this, it really came down to kind of one phrase that was in my job description when I started in my, uh, my current position. So um, my appointment is 70% is teaching, 30% research. And uh, I'm one of like two faculty in my department that have a majority teaching appointment. Uh, that's, that's tenure track and most of them have majority uh, research or in some cases majority extension and uh, and one line from my job description was that I needed to develop a nationally recognized teaching program and when I started I, I had like no idea how like how do you become nationally recognized for teaching when your audience is students here at K-State and um, I got a few ideas from other faculty on how, how they do it uh, most of it was kind of related to service activities within like NAC, uh, NACTA, the North American Colleges and Teachers of Agriculture, kind of like a teaching professional society uh, or through our kind of regular professional societies. Uh, but what I realized is uh, there was a need uh, for open textbooks in soil science. And so I was addressing something that actually had a need, uh, but also uh, by, by developing these textbooks, I was able to get my name out there and sort of build national recognition uh, for my teaching program. And so I was accomplishing something that was actually in my job description. Um, so, so this book, uh, the, the five other institutions that have adopted it, uh, as far as I know, they're the only ones I have. And that's why I uh, kind of reached out to see if they wanted to collaborate on this. Uh, but I, I also made an open lab manual uh, for my intro of souls class. And that book has been adopted by like 130 different instructors from around the world. And so, yeah, so these products have really kind of helped accomplish this national recognition part. Um, now my, de my department has been very fair in, in evaluating everyone based on their actual appointment. And so I am truly evaluated uh, as 70% of my teaching efforts and 30% of research. In some departments, that might not be the case. And so, um, so I think if someone wants to go through this sort of endeavor, uh, it might be good to just sort of engage some of the, um, either your department head or some people that are experienced with the promotion and tenure process in their departments to figure out kind of how this stuff would be perceived. And if I would have got signals that it, it would not be acknowledged the way that it has been, then I, I probably wouldn't have done it, done it, or maybe I would have waited until it was actually tenured. Uh, but yeah, luckily I was in a department where it was it was encouraged. Thank you, I appreciate you sharing your, your very candid experience with that. And I think it's, it's great that your department is acknowledging this very good work. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> All right, so, um, so is there any questions in the chat that I, that I haven't addressed yet? The chat has been great. I think you've addressed the questions that have come up in there for the most part. I, I bought a book um, from, from the chat uh, just a couple seconds ago <laughs> based on some people's recommendations, but no, I, I think you've kept up with that. I did have a, a reaction earlier to the cold calling. Um, I, I remember I had a, a Greek history professor. He gets so excited when he taught, he would spit on us. Um, you just have you know saliva flying. So you'd sit in the third row or, or behind to not get spit oh. on. But he would, he would do these really kind of caustic confrontations of us about you know, what happened in this part of the book? What happened in that book? And if you didn't answer immediately, he would accuse us of not having done the reading. So when you had kind of said that, I had like the flashback to sophomore year sitting in the third row of this Greek history class. So I understand it's kind of important to get our students to participate. So how do you do it without kind of traumatizing your students later so that, you know, 25 years after the fact, I'm not immediately transported back to that PTSD situation? 
Good question. Uh, so I, I think one is uh, these classes are usually relatively small. Uh, so my enrollment in it has been between like 10 and 20 students for about every semester that I've taught it. And so I can pretty quickly uh, become familiar with what the backgrounds of each of the students are. Uh, now, one example is uh, if we might be talking about some conservation practice that uh, maybe is not as prevalent in Western Kansas as it is in Eastern Kansas, because out West it's all dry and out East might have more issues with say water erosion or something. And so what I'll do is um, if I have a question where either I'm curious or I think the rest of the class might be curious on what uh, students think uh, for someone from, from out West versus out East, uh, I'll, I'll sort of address that in the question. So I uh, kind of give them some guardrails, I guess, and kind of ease them into the question. And, and that way it's it's more where I'm, I guess I'm, I'm trying to come at more of an invitation to discuss it than I am uh, just, a, just a straight up cold call of, uh, what do you what do you think on this it's uh like here's why i'm pulling you out what do you think um and then also i, I do allow them to uh to take a pass because I, I know that all all students uh i mean they might have had a couple big exams right before that le that lecture and re that reading assignment maybe wasn't the top of the priority list and it might not be representative of of what their approach to the class is the rest of the semester and so if they uh, if they didn't read it, I mean, it's, it's not the end of the world. Uh, and how I sort of grade this participation is, uh, if for the most part, when I try to engage them in class, uh, if they seem like they were pretty much always on top of the reading, then they get the full credit. Uh, or if they ask really good questions, even if they didn't read it, uh, that's that has value too. So how do your students kind of reflect on this experience? Because we have differing motivations of our students. And it sounds like this is an experience that if they were to lean into, there'd be lots of personal and professional development, mm -hmm. but there's an investment. I mean, you don't develop without work. So I'm kind of wondering how did the end of they reflect on these really amazing things that they've done, even though along the way, there might've been kind of hiccups or resistances. Um, I usually have sort of a mix of responses to this. Uh, about the only complaint that I've had is that some students think the class just has too much busy work. And so I've, I've uh, I mean, there, there are other assignments beyond just the reading assignments. And so I've tried to dial back uh, some of the other assignments as I can, uh, just to make it so there's just kind of less busy work overall. Uh, and the other thing is I, I try, try to make it so that the readings that they're assigned aren't like 30 or 40 page reports. If they are, then I, I tell them to, to pay close attention to one section. So if you only read five pages, these are the five pages to read. And so that way we can kind of zero in on, on what the important stuff is. So, so part of it is, is just kind of trying to narrow it down to, uh, to the core amount of, of work they need to do for the class. Um, yeah, I think for the most part, it's been, it's been pretty well received. Because I, I, I think it's, it's a very applied class. And I think having, it, having the readings be also uh, very applied, I think that is, is appreciated. And I tell them that the op the other option uh, to me doing it this way is for me to just give a boring lecture. <laughs> uh, I, I told them that I got bored when I was when I was teaching it in that style uh, at the beginning, and for a class this size, yeah, a discussion seems like the way to go. Excellent. Um, I want to give you the opportunity to ask the questions of this audience uh, that that you had kind of laid out. So, um, if people don't have other questions, you can by all means ask those questions. All right. So. Share my screen again. So the two questions I had, uh, we'll start with the, with the first one. What strategies, what strategies do you use to engage students in assigned readings? So what do you guys think? What strategies do you, do you use to engage students in their assigned readings? So this is something that I've been working on, uh, developing a lot over the past couple of years, um, being engaged in communities of practice like this to talk through ideas. Um, and I have landed on having, cause I also like kind of that flipped classroom style, really getting students involved in classroom discussion. Um, and like Don, I have a lot of PTSD from my own experience as an undergrad, as I, I was not particularly a, a bright student. I was a hard worker, but I, I just never really got, like I would do the reading and I would get to class and the professor would ask me a question and I'd be like, I remember nothing like I have and they'd be like you didn't do the reading and I would 
get so frustrated because I had done the homework. I just didn't remember anything. So with all of that in mind, I, whenever I assign my students readings, or it can be like, when I say readings or texts, it can be like an actual text or it's a video or um, I'll assign political cartoons and have them like analyze those, things like that to have them, you know, look at it beforehand and give them questions to answer or pull out quotes from the text so that when they come to class, they have like something physically written down that like, oh, I thought this was really interesting. And I find that that helps classroom discussions <laughs> uh, go really well because, you know, they, you know, when I ask them a question, they have something that they can look to and they don't have to rely on their memory of like, oh, I did the reading three days ago and now I don't have any idea what I said. It's like, oh, right, right, right. I wrote it down here. Um, and I've found that then that also helps me in planning class because I'm like, okay, what did I tell them to do? Oh, I wanted them to like pull out three quotes that they thought were interesting. Okay, so we're gonna start the class with talking about the quotes that they found interesting. Um, and it makes, you know, then it's kind of a cyclical thing because it's like they have their preparation and then we do the thing in class and then they do after class, they do the next preparation um, and things work together really well. Like there's, it feels a lot more cohesive than when I used to just teach, like read this text and then we're going to talk about it in class and just like ask them questions. Um, I find like that's, that's been working really well for me. That's a good idea. I like the idea of doing the prompts. All right, uh, Sarah, I see you have your hand up. So I have recently learned um, about the app Perusal, P-E-R-S-U-A-L-L, -L, that we can use through Canvas. Um, as a librarian, sometimes I work with classes multiple times, but often it's one time, and that's not a lot of minutes to go over everything that's involved in reading an article and then getting into the research process. Um, but I like perusal because we can upload an article ahead of time and then everybody in the class can go in and annotate it based upon questions like Andy's mentioned that she has. Um, and it lets us uh, both teach students how to read an article um, and like the professor and I can like respond to comments ahead of time. And then we can address like themes and how this plays into, in our case, the research process. Um, and it's more of a communal thing and it does have that awesome uh, possibility of, well, how do you most effectively approach an article um, or a chapter or whatever you happen to be reading? Um, and then it also has the benefit for um, the, the students in your class who just won't talk for whatever reason. Um, they can still participate in the discussion. It's just going to be more text-based, and then the people who are always going to talk will still always talk. And so a, a similar service to that that I'm uh, more familiar with is Hypothesis. And there's a there's a period be before the IS. Mm -hmm. Put that in the chat. Uh, so it sounds like Hypothesis and Perusal are about the same type of service. Yeah, I looked uh, at Hypothesis um, a little bit too before going to Perusal. I can't remember. I think I just went with Perusal because either it worked with more formats or if it was easier, it was more easy to use in Canvas. It was one of those two things. Okay. Yeah, so I've, I've thought about doing that uh, for, uh, for this class. And then um, there, there's ways to, to have a hypothesis built into the, to the press books version, like the web book version of the textbook. Uh, but I think that has to be for PDFs that are actually hosted on the website for the web book. And so that might actually be, I don't know, I got a little bit antsy about that because it's, it's P, a lot of times it's PDFs that are copyrighted that should be somewhere else. And so I didn't want to get in trouble that way. But or we can uh, find uh, articles from open access journals for you. Yeah. yeah. So uh, and I guess one good thing about some of the resources that I use is a lot of them are federal uh, documents. And so those don't necessarily have the same copyright uh, restrictions. Uh, but when it, when it comes from like a land grant, like Hey State, all that stuff is, has a traditional copyright on it and it's not as easy to use, but yeah, that's a good way to do it. I, I, what I like about that approach is everyone else gets to, they get to read it for themselves and figure out what they enjoy or, or what stuck out to them. Uh, but also it cause sort of highlights things that they wouldn't have otherwise paid that much attention to. Like maybe there's just one line or one little factoid that, uh, that 
they kind of skimmed over and didn't notice, but is actually worth a good discussion in class. So they kind of, yeah, it's like reading as a group as opposed to just individually. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, for Sarah's sake, I just want you to know I have a hot potato. <laughs> so let me, let me uh, follow up with that by saying, because I teach at two different levels, I teach freshmen, and of course we're trying to teach them to read, <laughs> period. <laughs> that um, in, our, in our course where we all teach together, there are like nine sections of it. We have our students do graphic notes. So in addition to them, and, and it's a requirement, we have a checklist. So it's mandatory because we were finding when we tried to ask them to read material for design, they would skip over the reading material. So that's, that's one thing. I don't like that way myself. So I do a couple of other things. Sometimes I make it a game and, and those results come through that way. And I think I've shared that with the group before, but I've, I've also done another thing that Sarah's talking about is that we read some of that material together, but then I may come back and say, let's find a video that reinforces that. And they're likely to watch that video as a reinforcement for the work that they either read or didn't read. But at some point that that's another way to get the same information across or broaden it. The other thing I'll do with my upper level students is pose a question out of that that's very controversial and say, okay, let's talk about that. What, which side of the line do you fall on? Do you agree that we sh that that something is happening in our society or not? And that generates a lot of discussion. And so somewhere in there, the content of that material that they would have read comes through in their argument one way or another in defending or not. So I sort of use a debate uh, format to get that across. Kobe, one of, one of the things that I've tried um, in, in my CAT community class, and for those of you who are aware of the CAT community programs, it's a first year experience class. So these are people who are just ending college. Um, I, I made a deal with them. I said, you know, I could have you read a bunch of articles or I'll write you one single space page of what I want you to know this week. You're going to read it. We're going to have a quiz on it when you come in, and then we're going to talk about it. And they've taken that deal and run with it. They come in prepared now. And I think it's, it's, it's hard sometimes to boil it down to one single space page. There's obviously a little bit of time expenditure for me to put out there in doing that. But it was a conversation with, with Brian Lynchfield a few years ago that made me kind of think of this. It's, we have a better idea what our students need to do about our classes than anyone else. You know, we, we kind of cobble together the readings and the things like that. But if you were to write what you wanted your students to know to be prepared for discussion, what would you write? And that's, and that's what I do. Um, and then what happens is I update those, you know, semester to semester as we kind of go through. Many of them are largely unrevised from semester to semester because I want to have to continue to have that discussion. But it makes it really easy to, to replace one or to add to one or to pull one out. Um, and, and they're kind of fun uh, to kind of think about and preparing myself for the conversation we'd have is what points do I want to lead them to? Um, so that's something that I've done that I really liked. I do want to ask a question in the chat. For those of you who haven't been watching in the chat, um, there's a wonderful conversation, wonderful idea sharing going in there. But there is a question for you, Colby. Um, and the question is, if you could go back and give yourself advice at the beginning of embarking and co-writing an annotated bib with your students, what would that advice be? Uh, I wish I would have started it sooner. <laughs> uh, I, I do enjoy teaching it with, with this resource uh, a lot better than I did with the with the previously required textbook. Um, and also, I think that the survey like study that I'm working on right now, I kind of wish I would have uh, would have gotten that uh, more fi finalized and started administering that earlier, just to have more years of data. Um, but as far as like actually having the students contribute to it the way they did, um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the way everything turned out. So, um, and I'm, I'm currently working on sort of a similar project for my, my intro soil science class that that class is everything from freshmen to seniors in it. And, and we since replaced the textbook and, and I have kind of like the basics of, of, uh, of the reading assignments that are, that are in there, but 
Yeah, maybe one thing of what might have changed is maybe kind of constrain uh, how big the project was going to get initially, and then uh, worry about like expanding it from uh, from that point, just with uh, future iterations of of student contributions. But it ended up being a lot to start off with, so it took a lot of time. <laughs> um, see, uh, Eva has her hand raised, and I think after that. I, we have the other question that I want to get to as well, but uh, Eva, what do you have? Well, mine, mine's not, mine's more of a question too, because I, I like everybody's idea, but I'm involved with principles of biology. And when, when we had used to have a lot of enrollment, you know, we do have 780 students a semester and we had, we have reading assignments and then they needed to read that as a background for what they would do in class. And often they wouldn't, and we would have these little quizzes, um, but still they would skim through, or actually I'm, I'm discovering that they're Googling answers to quizzes that we give them instead of reading our material. Um, I'm wondering if anybody has any suggestions for how, I mean, we can't do discussions and do these other things with 780 students. Uh, we have 78 per section, but still, they all have the same, same material. So. We need the in-class time to do the in-class materials so we can't do discussions of the reading there. So, so I'm kind of wondering if anybody's got any ideas for how we can encourage them to actually stick with our material instead of looking for a video online that may have weird terminology or something we don't even test them on. So I, I have one suggestion for you. Uh, so I, I know you guys use an open textbook for the, your biology course. Mm -hmm. And I know with, uh, with the HTML5 language, you can build questions where like they would read a section uh, of, of, the, of the book and then they would answer uh, within, the H, uh, within a little block that would come at the bottom uh, where they would actually submit their response to some question that was related to the content directly above it. Ah. And so you could actually incorporate those types of quiz questions in, in the book. Uh, ah. Now, I'm, I don't have any expertise in that. I just know that it's possible, uh, but yeah, that, that would probably be, be something that would be worth exploring for that uh, that program. Yeah. And I bet if you talk to the, the instructional designers here at K-State, they probably have ideas on how exactly that could be done. Okay, that's a good idea, thanks. You might also wanna look at how much text you're assigning and what, um, I don't know, maybe it's very reasonable, but that's one thing that I found is that I used to assign readings that were about 20 pages and it's just too much for the students that we have not most of our most of my students at least are working full time in addition to being students and they're just doing a ton of stuff and trying to get in all that reading for each class is just too much and so by giving them shorter texts or even when I you know occasionally I do give them longer texts when I give them longer texts I give them specific questions that I want them you know you need to be able to answer these things. So they can go through and skim, like it's in a kind of a way to give them a shortcut so that they can find like, okay, I need to be able to get this, this, and this. Um, but I find that that's been one of the big things is that as soon as I started giving them less, they've done way better in class. They get it way more. So if yeah, you can- Sorry, last semester, we, we just started cutting things down to, to as little as we could get on each one. So we just started doing that last semester. Um, but I'm still finding that students will, will they're, they're looking for things, videos. They want videos. They don't want to do our material. They, they want to listen to a lecture. And I had one post a high school biology lecture that they found online for the other students to watch and said, this will help you. You know, it's like, no, do this. <laughs> <laughs> Eva, I was gonna say in addition to the question within the segments, um, we've tried with a, a little smaller group, but if you break them up into conversational groups, you might also be able to have them do um, conversation and response to each other. And Canvas will let you uh, tabulate whether they're responding and how many times they've responded. So you'd be mm -hmm. able to see whether they're actually engaged in the conversations. And you, you could set up how many groups you want uh, or you can, uh, you don't want to do 700 in one class, but, but you could set up smaller, almost like lab sections uh -huh. that have to respond and have conversation and, and see where they, where they go. 
with it? Are they using the vocabulary? And then at the end, what we did is just tabulate it. Did you do two for every one of the questions or and comment to somebody else? And if you did meet that criteria, then we said you were engaged. Yeah. Okay, cool. That, that's Thanks. another way. Eva, I might also ask, um, is there a way you can illustrate in the first couple of classes how the content they're Googling is doing them a disservice in the lab? This is something I've only recently really figured out that they're doing. Um, because they've we've we've since we've cut down the textbook and we've got very specific terms that we use in class now. And this past semester with the, the COVID restrictions and teaching online, we've been giving them um, questions for where they actually have to answer out by writing something out. And they will give me a term for, some, for something. It's, it's a real term, but it's not one we used in our class, in any of our material. And so they're getting information from places, other places, and, and paying attention to that instead of the terminology we give them. Um, and so, it's, it's a problem I've just recently discovered. So I'm trying to sort out how to, how to best get them to not do that anymore. All right, so I, I got, we're just about out of time here, but I got a question about, uh, can we save the chat? So if you look at the, at the right, uh, where you actually type a message in the chat, there's three little dots. If you click on that, you can click save chat. And um, I'm actually not sure where, where it actually gets saved to but anyone have experience on how to save the chat? There's a lot of good stuff in there that I actually want to go back and read because I was busy talking or listening earlier. But. It should It'll be with the recording. Oh, okay. It should be saved with the recording when that goes on. Even actually, though when you see it, it's I, I asked that question and I did figure it out. So uh, we, we are about of time. I, I want to I wanna begin by, but I have a couple of announcements, so don't sign off forever, but I want to begin by thanking Colby for sharing wonderful thoughts, wonderful presentations, and I want to thank you for all the wonderful work you do for your students, Colby. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for, uh, for participating today. So a couple of announcements. As I said at the beginning, we do this every Wednesday at noon. Many of you are frequent attenders, so you know this already. Same Zoom link every week. Next week, Ellie Sayer is going to be talking about equitable practices in undergraduate research mentoring, um, which is, is a really cool topic I'm very excited about. I also have something I want to put on your radar, and it's kind of a favor slash offer. We do video series of the Teaching and Learning Center. Hopefully you've seen these. Hopefully you've seen our Teachers Thriving Remotely series. Hopefully you've seen our Remote Teaching uh, Fail series. And if you haven't, you need to check those out. They're awesome. We have a new series we're putting together called Teachers Telling Stories. So what we need are teachers to tell stories. And if maybe you don't even have a story, but you know someone who does, I would love to invite them or offer you the opportunity to be part of our series. So for instance, and Lindy Arrow has a wonderful story involving duct tape that she won't tell us, but we're gonna make her tell it on video. So if you know that someone has this wonderful story and I can reach out to them and say, hey, someone told me you have this wonderful story on this thing, I would love to include them in the series. We're talking about you know one to two minute videos where you tell a story somehow related to teaching. Maybe it's a story you tell your classes. Maybe it's a story about you becoming a teacher. Maybe it's a story about you having been a student. But if it's a story that in any way relates to teaching, and ideally might even be kind of a feel good, optimistic, or even funny kind of thing, that would be awesome. Um, but we would love to have you as part of our series. So follow up with me with an email if you're interested. And again, if you have a colleague that you think I need to invite to do this, let me know who they are, maybe even what story you'd like them to tell, and I will reach out. Um, those are all of my announcements. So if anyone has any questions, we'll stick around for a little bit. Otherwise, thank you so much for attending this week and we can't wait to see you next week.